folks. Welcome to the old Integral Stage Author Series with me, Layman Pascal. You know, we've been thinking for a while about talking to Matthew Seagal about his book on the philosophical physics of Alfred North Whitehead. So when I saw him the other day having a great chat with John Verveke, I thought, hey, I know both those guys and even have opinions about the arcane topics they're discussing. So I reached out to Matt to propose that we plug his book, that we explore the intersections of Whitehead and Nietzsche, that we see if the metaphysics of adjacency fits into this at all, and maybe at the same time give folks a little more clarity about some of Whitehead's major ideas. I think like Gebser, Whitehead is one of those profound thinkers who makes us feel very impressed, but about whom we often don't know exactly what he was trying to specify. Now, to be fair, Matthew is a professional philosophy professor who's been sitting with these ideas for years, and I'm an unpaid backwoods dandy who got a copy of his book three days ago. So hopefully I'll be able to hold my own as an interlocutor and maybe bring some playfulness to these concepts. But if I go down in flames, folks, at least you know I gave it a shot. Hi, Matt. Good to be with you again. Great to be with you too, Layman. I got to say, I'm still surprised that they pay me to do this stuff. So I feel very lucky, you know, to be in that position. But um, I will always consider myself an amateur of ideas because, you know, uh, the universe is vast and most of it will remain in the shadows for me. And, you know, the best I can hope to do is let my eyes adjust so that more becomes apparent. But um, yeah, I, I really look forward to exploring these these ideas with you because if, if they're not understandable um, by someone as intelligent uh, as you are um, and, you know, just by the average person who has any degree of, you know, concern for the, the deeper structure of reality, then I have not succeeded at my, at my task. So just to get this out of the way, let's where can people buy this book, which they would be fools not to have a copy of if they have any interest in understanding whitehead process thinking or the integrated worldview that's possible on the far side of modernism and dualism? Well, here's the book here. Um, yeah, it is only available on Amazon.com, published by Sacrosage. You know, it's that whole print on demand um, model that allows um, small publishers to to get books out there without laying out a bunch of money that they don't have up front and so you know that's how jeff bezos has really cornered the market so amazon.com now i noticed there were uh there was sort of a dedication to eric weiss and brian swim and i wanted to ask you at the outset what those guys mean to you eric weiss was um he passed away recently he was the philosopher who was responsible for really introducing me to Whitehead in a graduate context, graduate school context. I had heard of Whitehead before studying with Eric, but I was not brave enough to uh, dive into those texts um, on my own. I was warned against trying to do that. And, you know, so I read some secondary sources, but then it was with Eric back in 2008 at uh, the California Institute of Integral Studies that I began studying Whitehead. And, you know, Eric is also a, well, I, I will use the present tense because he wrote a bit about, um, quite a bit about immortality and what he called the long trajectory of the soul uh, afterlife. Um, he was also a devotee of um, Sri Aurobindo. And so my, um, introduction to Whitehead was always sort of colored by this Indian yogi and revolutionary's vision uh, of, of a spiritual evolution. You know, it's not that Whitehead is um, all that different, but he's more of a physicist um, and a mathematician rather than a sort of grand evolutionary, you know, practitioner of integral yoga or something. Um, but Whitehead for me always was in that context because of the way that Eric introduced his ideas. And then Brian Swim is a cosmologist, um, also a professor at CIIS, um, now a colleague of mine. And people aren't familiar with his work. He basically, as a doctoral student, um, and his dissertation was on sort of alternative approaches to um, relativity, to general relativity and the study of gravity. And, you know, he's, he worked on all the the mathematics around that to see the different possibilities there. And then, you know, once he uh, successfully defended his dissertation, he picked up a rock and dropped it 
and realized he had no fucking idea how that happened. <laughs> and so, you know, he taught math for a bit, but then really inspired by both Teilhard de Chardin, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit paleontologist, as well as Thomas Berry. Um, Brian was sort of lured out of teaching mathematics. I think he was in Washington at, um, uh, was it Washington State University perhaps, but he was lured into what became known as the teaching the story of the universe, which is an attempt, I would say, to provide a narrative or a mythos that is scientifically grounded, but that lets human beings feel a sense of um, connection to and embeddedness within uh, the universe. Um, and to really see ourselves as like the crest of, of the wave of cosmic evolution. Brian actually supervised what was the first draft of this book when it was, it was like 30 pages long. It was my comprehensive exam. And so, um, you know, his, his feedback, his mentorship and, um, sort of steering my, my research was really important, um, as you know, for, to sort of inaugurate the, uh, the writing of this text, which I've been kind of revising and expanding for almost 10 years now. And I think I'm finally done with it. <laughs> Well, that journey from mathematics to telling the story of the universe sort of parallels something about Whitehead as well, because I think a lot of people are familiar with him from his work with Bertrand Russell, and you might get the impression of a, you know, a, a very dry English professor working on formal mathematics and the underlying principles of logic. And then you want to say, well, what the hell happened? How does this guy end up with this vast electro psychedelic cosmo organic vision? Right. Um, did he go through a transformation personally? Was he influenced by someone? Was it a natural outgrowth of his work in clarifying and conceptualizing the roots of the reality structures of logic? Or was he just always like that and we didn't notice at first? So how do you tell how do you tell the story of Whitehead's transition? Well, Bertrand Russell tells the story that it was a, as a result of Whitehead's son, Eric, dying in World War I in 19, 1918, I guess, that pulled Whitehead into metaphysics and speculative philosophy in search of some consolation. Um, I think that is a, a bullshit account, to be frank, um, because, you know, if that were the case, you would think that Whitehead might have had more to say about personal immortality uh, and try, trying to secure a, some justification for that metaphysically so that he might, you know, believe that his son was, was somehow still existing in, in some form. But he didn't do that. His, his metaphysics is decidedly um, agnostic about that question. It doesn't say it's impossible, doesn't say it necessarily occurs either. Personal immortality is kind of beside the point um, for Whitehead. In, in the context of his cosmology. And so, yeah, it wasn't that his son died. It was, I think, really just a function of the second scientific revolution, um, which was brought about, you know, most mostly by Einstein, but also by quantum theory, uh, which Einstein didn't like. And so there's almost two scientific revolutions that occurred in the early 20th century. And, you know, Whitehead was as early as, you know, 1898 when he published his book, uh, Universal Algebra. Um, he was already thinking about the relationship between mathematics and physics and, and uh, space. And so in 1905, he publishes another paper called um, Mathematical Conceptions of the Material World. And he comes up with like four or five different uh, approaches to mathematically modeling space and time and matter. And the fourth or fifth model starts to approach something like a relativistic view. He hadn't yet read Einstein's special theory of relativity in 1905, uh, even though he's he publishing this in the same year, right? But probably five, six years later, he becomes aware of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Einstein at that point was already working on the general theory. Um, that's the same period that Principia Mathematica was, was published. I think the final... The third uh, volume came out in like 1912, I think. Um, they were supposed to have a fourth volume, which would deal with geometry and space, but the war started and Russell was a pacifist and Whitehead's kid was in the war and they disagreed about that. And so they, they stopped collaborating. 
But Whitehead was uh, really taken by this relativistic revolution. He was present at the Royal Society in 1919 when Sir Arthur Eddington revealed the results of this study of the eclipse that occurred that Einstein said he made a prediction about how much the sun's uh, the, the stars around the sun's light would bend during the eclipse because of the gravitational effect of the sun. It was an accurate prediction. And so, you know, Whitehead's present when it is announced that um, Newtonian physics is basically done for. And that, I think, just the, just the physics of it really pulled Whitehead into metaphysics because he realized that the old mechanical conception uh, no longer made any sense. And he saw that in other sciences, like in biology, there was all this reference being made to mechanism, but he realized as a mathematical physicist that the biologists were pointing uh, at a now outdated ontology. And so he set to work trying to, to reimagine the, the basis of, um, of reality, of causality, and, and try to put contemporary 20th century science on uh, a more solid foundation. Seems like he, you know, really took physics seriously from a philosophical perspective. Like I, I have the sense that he, uh, you know, even before relativity and quantum physics, he was thinking pretty deeply about Maxwell and Faraday and what it means for there to be fields and flows and forces and waves underlying our reality. Um, what do you think he saw in the relativity model that Einstein himself might not have seen? Well, Whitehead was influenced by uh, the French philosopher um, Henri Bergson and, and Bergson um, famously had this little debate with Einstein in 1922 about the nature of time. And Whitehead agreed with Bergson's critique of Einstein, which is that Einstein's philosophical interpretation of relativity is such that time itself, and, and Einstein meant like real time, is just a fourth dimension of space or can be exhaustively measured as a fourth dimension of space. And for Bergson, for Whitehead, this falsifies time by spatializing it. And uh, it's not that either Bergson or Whitehead disagreed with the, the predictions that Einstein's theory made. I mean, they, they, there are lots of empirical confirmations, not just the eclipse, but, you know, in the last, you know, many decades since Einstein's theory, it's been confirmed over and over again that this is a real effect, the relativistic effects clearly are, um, are present, but it's a matter of the philosophical interpretation and whether or not Einstein's equations and the sort of Riemannian four-dimensional geometric manifold that, uh, and the Lorentz uh, transformations that allow us to make sense of the, the relativistic uh, conceptions of space and time. It's a, it's, a, it's a question of whether or not concrete time, as in actually experienced time, is in any, in any way escapes these equations. Um, you know, Einstein inaugurated a new scientific revolution, but he's still basically working with the Cartesian method of science. And so he relativized space and time, but he didn't relativize the scientific method and our understanding of the place of the observer in nature. Whitehead would say, rather than calling it relativity theory, I think he'd rather call it relational theory. It's the relational theory of space and time. And when you use that term, it is more clear what amendments need to be made to that Cartesian subject object structure. The knower is embedded in the process being known and is in fact an expression of that very process. And so, you know, Bergson in his more poetic and intuitive way tried to give voice to this, unfortunately, in his, his book, um, Duration and Simultaneity, which was a kind of rebuttal of attempt to rebut Einstein, again, metaphysically, not physically, to rebut Einstein's implicit philosophical interpretation. Bergson seems to have made some scientific mistakes in regard to like the, the twin paradox, which is this thought experiment Einstein developed. And so people dismissed Bergson because it seemed like he didn't understand the physics. You can't make that claim about Whitehead. He clearly understood the physics. Whitehead also had a chance to argue with Einstein at a party at uh, 
the British philosopher and statesman Lord Haldane's house, also in, in 1921, actually. Einstein's English wasn't the best, and it's pro- it's possible, I'd say probable, that Whitehead was actually the superior mathematician. It's it's understood now that Einstein needed some help from his first wife and from others to kind of get the math of his theories right. I mean, brilliant conceptual thinker and 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 had a capacity to imagine himself riding a beam of light and like like brilliant genius. But but you know, math is a technical skill, and it seems like Whitehead was like a human calculator. And so Einstein said he didn't understand Whitehead's critique. Could have been the language barrier. He had an interpreter there to help him. I, you know, Whitehead's German wasn't great. Einstein's English wasn't great at this point. So they didn't understand each other. But the critique is basically that time is, or there's clock time, right, that can be measured and spatialized. And we can make predictions about the movement of bodies using those equations, using, using clock time. But there's another kind of time which for Bergson, he called duration. Whitehead borrows that term. You could also just say it's process. And so there's kind of a primary process. And this is, you know, the event ontology that Whitehead articulates. And that primary process is in some ways prior to metrical space and time. It's prior to to extended space. And it's prior to the kind of time that can be you know, accounted for in, in terms of the measurements of a clock. And that primordial process is a source of creativity for Whitehead. And for Whitehead, it does not make any sense to talk about the future as in some way already manifest in that fourth dimension of the Romanian manifold. Um, you know, Einstein famously said uh, in a letter to his best friend's widow, um, that don't worry about it. He's he may be gone, but uh, time for us physicists is nothing but a stubbornly persistent illusion. There's no difference between the past, the present, and the future. There is only eternity. We're in it. So you know, the dead are not really dead, and the living are not really living. <laughs> um, it's like there's been a, a struggle in physics between people who take time seriously or not. I yeah, know in the last uh, you know ten or twenty years, a number of prominent physicists have been trying to take time more seriously than just treating it as an extension of a spatial manifold. Um, clearly, Bergson and Whitehead seem to be doing something like that, and I, I'm always very curious about you know time treated philosophically. I heard someone recently, uh, <coughs> Sheldrick, uh, say that uh, Whitehead's primary innovation in his mind was that he shifted the subject-object relation from a spatial frame to a temporal frame. So that rather than thinking of it as an inner and outer, he's thinking of it as a future and a present or a future and a past. Any truth to that? Yeah, I think that's that's quite accurate. Yeah, so for Descartes, the subject and the object are distinct substances. Um, and so you, you can say that, well, that's a spatial distinction. The subject is inside. The object is everything outside and the subject comes to know the object by internally representing it. And for Descartes, the only thing we can know for certain about the outside, the objects is um, through geometry uh, and mathematics. And so, and lucky us, we're divinely chosen subjects who have the blueprint and the mathematical intellect so that, you know, we can know uh, and measure nature in this way. Um, God granted us sort of the, um, a glimpse at the the blueprint, you know. But for Whitehead, subject and object become, um, yeah, you could say temporalized in the sense that he articulates what's called the process of concrescence, which is how each moment comes to, becomes, how each moment becomes, or how it comes to be, um, and it comes to be by the uh, all of the objects in the surrounding environment, which are in the past growing together, which is literally what concrescence means, and being shaped into by the desire of a nascent sort of larval subject, the the objects grow together into a new subjective perspective, which is, is a new creation in the universe, which sort of takes the macrocosm, the objective macrocosm, and uh, transforms it into a subjective microcosm, a microcosmic perspective, 
And Whitehead will say that the many become one and are increased by one as a result of this process of concrescence. And so, yeah, objects are the past, the subject is the present. And he coins this new term superject to refer to the way that as soon as that subject uh, realizes its novel perspective, it perishes and becomes sort of a gift to the future, a superject, which can then be inherited by the next concrescence. And so the universe is this iterative, cumulative process of, of uh, concrescence, whereby at every point, a new perspective is emerging, which achieves some subjective value, which is then given back to the universe so that the next moment of concrescence is in some way enhanced or sometimes retarded, uh, held back. It's, it's not a given that there will be an advance into more complexity in Whitehead's scheme, though there does seem to be a tilt toward complexity evident in the structure of our cosmos. So, you know, that's the cumulative nature of time for Whitehead. The past and the future are ontologically distinct. The future is merely possible. It does not yet have actual existence. The past is already actualized, right? And the present is sort of the tension um, between these two, inheritance and anticipation. And depending on the complexity of the, the concrescence, there's the capacity in higher grade forms of, of concrescence for more anticipation, for more novelty to be ingressed as Whitehead's terms, so that the past is not just repeated. And yeah, so it's, it's a totally, it's, it, it, I would agree with Sheldrake that that is um, one of Whitehead's most important innovations to totally reimagine the relationship between subject and object in a temporal way. Yeah. That uh, it's like you just gave the snapshot of the, the Whiteheadian cosmos, uh, which is huge. And I think a lot of people can appreciate its power and its, uh, you know, almost psychedelic quality. But we'll, um, I think we'll move in and out of that picture and unpack some of those parts as we go along. I want to ask a, a different kind of question, though, and then we'll come back to the picture, which is from reading your texts that you sent me, if I may say, it seems like you've got a real uh, hard on for Schelling. You know, <laughs> what is it you think Schelling was way ahead on? And why is Schelling relevant to studying Whitehead? Yeah, so Schelling is... He's a German idealist philosopher, right? And um, he's one of those really important thinkers who comes after Kant and tries to make sense of what Kant called the Copernican revolution in philosophy. And I am following actually an Australian philosopher named Aaron uh, Gare, who says that Schelling is really a process philosopher and that Whitehead is in this, um, Whitehead didn't, really study Schelling too much um, directly. He does cite Schelling once. Whitehead read a book by a, a Russian philosopher uh, named Lossky that was a book about Schelling. And Whitehead got a lot of actually Hegel secondhand through his friends who were British idealists, um, McTaggart and, um, and others. And so Schelling is important because he inaugurates this, this new form of natural philosophy where the human knower, as I was trying to hint at earlier, is understood as, as intimately connected with the, the natural world that is being known. So much so that, you know, Schelling uses this phrase that, you know, the philosopher, the natural philosopher is nature itself philosophizing. And so this is an innovation upon the Kantian mode of thinking where there's still this, it's not a substance dualism like Descartes. It's more of an epistemological dualism in Kant between the phenomenal world that we can know with our a priori categories and the noumenal world that is um, beyond our capacity to, to experience. That framework for Schelling was a product of what he calls reflection, which he refers to as a kind of, if we get stuck in reflection, it's a spiritual sickness, Schelling says. And it not only causes our human spirit and soul to wither, uh, but it can negatively affect the, the, the natural world around us because we behave as if we were uh, not uh, an emergence out of it, as if we were not 
in any way linked with it. And so Schelling is trying to reimagine what natural science is and what natural philosophy is in this new, I guess, more participatory context where we really do try to understand consciousness as something that the universe is doing rather than something that, yeah, is, is an anomaly in the universe and that is either epiphenomenal or just some kind of um, a word game that we play at, you know, a lot of these 20th century forms of reductionism as, as they would have it. Um, and so Schelling, he's just a brilliant, poetic, uh, insightful philosopher who I think provides a, a lineage and a, and, a, and a context in the history of philosophy so that we can see Whitehead is not totally out of the blue. Um, there's some precedent here. So I try to draw those connections in the book. Yeah. I think for a lot of people, Schelling is a sort of obscure figure located somewhere around Hegel, you know, and um, you know, Nietzsche is aggressively misunderstood. Bergson seems underappreciated. Whitehead's later work is vague for a lot of folks. Why is it so difficult for conventional philosophical discourse to integrate this uh, de facto lineage of psychoactive transformational naturalists? Are, are they just allergic to the whiff of vitalism? Is it their communication style? Is it just that most people aren't deep enough or open enough to register what they're saying? Is, is there some disconnect there? Well, you know, there was... There was an opportunity in Schelling's day, I think, to inaugurate a alternative form of modern science. And, you know, it was either the organic route or the mechanistic route. And, you know, the mechanistic route had already been really established uh, by Descartes and Newton, though, when you really study, especially Newton, he's not this, this clockwork you know, mechanistic, as, as much a clockwork mechanistic thinker as we might assume, or as, as history often uh, leads us to assume most accounts of history. You know, Newton was, was also an alchemist. He was like spending just as much time calculating planetary orbits as he was trying to use the lunar cycle to determine like when Christ was born, you know, so he was still as much a magician as, as a mechanist. And similarly, like the other modern scientists, Galileo and Kepler were practicing astrologers. You know, Kepler had this really platonic archetypal understanding of pattern and harmony in nature. And so there, there was an opportunity for science to unfold in a very different way. And I think we ended up with this more mechanistic and materialistic conception being dominant rather than the organic and the participatory for the simple reason that the mechanical approach is more technologically productive and to do more advanced science you need more funding and because you need more sophisticated equipment and the only way you're going to get funding for that is if it has some kind of commercial application or military application and so there were these perverse incentives, I think, present even back in the beginning when, you know, Descartes worked a lot on ballistics to help, um, you know, with winning wars for his patrons. And so there's just the, these perverse incentives that draw, that drew science more towards the, more towards what I would call techno science and more towards a kind of knowledge, which I would call instrumental which is more about the knowledge to instrumentally um, transform and, and control nature than it is about um, the sort of knowledge where we would gain insight into uh, the processes by which, you know, nature grows um, and develops. And so Schelling is an example of this alternative. There aren't many technological applications, at least in terms of the machines we might build, unless like Goethe say, we th think of the human being as a kind of instrument for doing science. A Schellingian method affords a, um, a sort of cultivation of our native suite of senses and cultivation of our imagination, our intuition, our capacity to, to develop new organs of perception. And so it's not as if the Schellingian, Goethean, and then Whiteheadian method would not be productive of you know, novelty and what we are like, like capable of, of perceiving. It's just that it would be more 
it would be modes of perception cultivated sort of organically as something embodied as something that is changing how we ourselves are conscious of the world around us rather than creating more advanced telescopes or microscopes or particle colliders or what have you. So, yeah, I think it's just, it's the, the, the will to power in some ways that drove science in this more mechanistic direction, even while the models produced that were supposed to explain nature have, have become, I think, increasingly clunky um, and that we're really in need of a kind of organic uh, reconceptualization so that these explanations make sense to us. So the sociological and economic incentives of modernity uh, favored the mechanistic form of modern science, which was very efficient for certain things, but leaves us in a quandary now that might have to be addressed by some, some version of a Whiteheadian style approach. I guess like, well, like most kids, I heard about Whitehead from Terence McKenna and then read Process and Reality. But that doesn't make me an expert on any of these concepts that are implied by the process philosophy of a generalized organismicity. So let's, let's dig into a couple of them here. What is, what is an actual occasion, right? Is it, is it the whole reality? Is it my full experience? Is it this entity? that looks like me, which, you know, where, where am I situating the term actual occasion? What do I, what should I be thinking of when I think of an actual occasion? So let's, let's back up for a second, just to, to note that Whitehead demarcates three different modes of reality, right? There are occurrences, actual occasions, occurrences, there are endurances, and there are recurrences. Okay. So Occasions, endurances, and recurrences. So occasions are, for Whitehead, more like the, um, the most basic category for him. Um, sometimes he calls them events, sometimes actual occasions, sometimes he calls them actual entities. Whitehead's universe, his cosmos, is, it's made of occasions. It's made of happenings. It's made of doings, you could say. It's not made of things. It's not a collection of stuff in a container of space-time. It is made of doings, happenings. There's um, something that wants to occur, right? And so an occurrence, an actual occasion is um, the process whereby, you know, the past is able to be made present again and then conveyed to the future. Now, occurrences are, they participate in what Whitehead calls eternal objects. And this is eternal objects are the things which recur. Um, eternal objects are kind of like platonic forms in that they give some definite shape to or quality to, you know, they're both mathematical forms, but also things like colors and tastes and smells. They're the adjectives that uh, qualify the occurrence of any experience. And they, they're the recurrences because Eternal objects are what allow us to recognize something and say, oh, there it is again. Despite the fact that we are in a processual cosmos where nothing happens the same twice, no occurrence repeats itself exactly. Every occurrence is novel, but it is inheriting the past. And so this is where the third notion of endurance comes in. Actual occasions can intimately inherit a lineage in, in, from the past, whereby um, the same eternal objects or like the same shape or, or definiteness or character can be inherited such that you get something like a rock, which seems to be a thing that is almost like a substance, like it's the same rock today as it is tomorrow, and maybe over millions of years, it gets weathered and whatever. But in a human lifespan, when we look at, you know, the pyramids at Giza, it's like, okay, that's the same pyramid. Uh, today as it was 2,000 years ago and probably will be there 2,000 years from now. Um, how do we recognize that? Well, it's, Whitehead would say, ingressing the same complex eternal objects, you know, the triangular shape, the golden color, etc. And that pattern recurs in the whole series of actual occasions. And there's, in, you know, countless actual occasions composing any given enduring society. But the 
the enduring lineage of occasions is ingressing eternal objects which recur right and so it's this these three notions of of the um occasions and, and recurrence and endurance are whitehead's way of sort of just triangulating a new um, uh, vision of reality that is processual but that still leaves room for um, something like identity so that we can recognize the same thing over and over again so it's it's not an easy vision to take on board initially because we're so used to thinking of things in space uh, moving in space for an occasion an actual occasion does not move it arises and perishes movement is something that has to do with endurance with occasions which are inheriting one another and so a moving body for whitehead is not an actual occasion it's an enduring um, society of actual occasions right and so we need this it's a whole new language that um, takes a little while to learn but once you learn it it really does alter your perception one i'll say one more thing just to try to make this more yeah. concrete at the level of human beings our souls what, what we refer to as the soul is for whitehead a a, a society a living society of actual occasions and you layman are inheriting your own past experience in a especially in an especially um, intimate way i'm inheriting my own past experience in an especially intimate way and you know there's physiological reasons for that you know the inheritance of my own experience is sort of insulated and sheltered by my organism and vice versa but um, we're also sharing an, a, an environment a planet and so while each of us has a soul that is in some ways unique. That soul is, has very fuzzy boundaries and is not in any way cut off from the surrounding world. Our souls are not in any way like separate substances. In each moment, as my occasions of experience arise and perish, they radiate, the, the, the perished occasions radiate to you, your perished occasions radiate to me, and we in that way are made of each other. Um, granted, we're mediated now by all this equipment, and so there's a special role for the electrons that are carrying the signal between us right now. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we are made of each other in a different way than if we were face to face right now. But you know, a, an enduring society of actual occasions. The, the most concrete example that we have of that in nature is, in fact, our own souls. And so Whitehead's trying to look at our own immediate experience and say, oh, okay, what are the general principles that you could almost say are, are phenomenologically applicable? How can that be generalized to the processes of nature, even at the, the subatomic scale? Like what is similar here? And um, that's where he gets his notion of actual occasions as the, the, the constituents out of which the universe is made. So I'm a I'm a swarm of events in space. I'm also a swarm of events through history that are inherited into this spatial swarm. I will I, let me just say it's yeah, yeah. so so there's a figure ground shift we have to make here. Actual occasions are not in space. Okay. Space and time are abstractions from the relationships between actual occasions. Okay. Uh, and so each each actual occasion of experience is bringing forth its own space time. And so I'm, a, I'm a hive of events which mm -hmm. can be unpacked into space and time. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That works. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, um, let's say, I pick up a coin, I flip the coin, I take a look at it. I'm like, hey, that's that same coin from before, basically. <laughs> so I've got an occurrence. I've got something enduring. But um, Am I supposed to think of that coin flip as if it were an entity or is the entity like my entire experience of reality in that moment? Like which one's the event? Is it the localized event or is, is all of this, the event and then is exceeded by the next total event? Well, I mean, ultimately the, the 
universe as a whole is the primary event of which we are sub events, right? But the thing is, when we talk about the universe as a, as a whole in Whitehead's terms, we have to remember that it is a creative advance. And so that whole is perpetually incomplete because it's always being added to by new perspectives which bud out of the whole. And so, you know, how do we distinguish between one event and another? It is ultimately a matter of convention. Our organism has evolved to, to sort of perceive what is relevant to its own survival. You know, Nietzsche makes this point that we're not evolved. We don't have a truth organ. We have uh, our, our perceptual capacities are more pragmatic than that. Um, and so from um, Whitehead's point of view, where we draw the lines around one event and another event depends on our interests. And generally, he, he has these other terms like nexus. Um, and so you, we could refer to the universe as a nexus of events which nexus refers to the sort of relationality, you know, everything Whitehead took on board this realization coming out of quantum theory that, you know, any little microscopic event, which occurs over here is non-locally connected to everything else. It might be an insignificant connection, but nonetheless, million years hence, you know, like they say in chaos theory, the butterfly flaps its wings, you, it could create a hurricane in, in a month. So, you know, how exactly events are connected is always going to be beyond our capacity to really determine with any certainty. But we make these distinctions, you know, for pragmatic purposes all the time, and it works well enough. You know, there's a difference between a metaphysical description, which is supposed to be the most generic account that we can possibly give of reality, um, such that all the special instances of, of our day-to-day -day experience are in some way um, that, that our metaphysical description is adequate to those special experiences. But when we're engaged in everyday experience, Whitehead just wants us to trust our, in, our instincts, basically, to know what event is relevant to what other event. Um, we don't need to get, you know, he's not trying to get us all to speak in his language. He's merely trying to provide people who are strange enough to care about mathematical physics and, and metaphysics, um, a, a coherent way of, of holding it all together. Trusting our instincts is a very interesting uh, concept because it runs right up against this, I would say, dichotomy in the philosophy of science between whether we should be trying to make our instincts, intuitions, and perceptions match up with our models, mm -hmm. or whether we should be trying to make our models match up with our perceptions and intuitions. Now, obviously, it's very satisfying to have our picture of the world more closely aligned with how we feel about the world. At the same time, you could argue that the, the power of the scientific enterprise comes precisely from challenging our instincts, intuitions, and perceptions. So like, how do we hold that? Because in the book, I get the sense that, you know, you're framing Whitehead as a guy who's standing up for our perception and our instincts and saying, yeah, our model should fit that in a way Sheldrake does that as well. And it, it's the point of contention on a lot of that thinking. Yeah. I mean, this is a huge issue in, I think, the public understanding of science there's a tendency to commit what Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which is when basically you mistake the model for the reality. And when physicists talk about the theory of everything and they, they presuppose that that theory of everything would be construed in mathematical terms and make reference to subatomic particles and, and, and that's it as if, life and mind are just sort of peripheral accidents that have no real bearing on the everything that is purportedly being explained. So first of all, the problem is that, you know, the mind doing the explaining isn't part of the theory, which leads to an epistemological quandary. Cause like, how do you know that? Like, where did you come from? I thought it was just particles. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of idolatry, is, is what Owen Barfield would call it. And Whitehead 
while he took science, physics in particular, very seriously uh, and was thrilled by the new discoveries being made, he also wanted to warn against this tendency toward model centrism, whereby we go about explaining away concrete experience by reference to something abstract, as if those abstractions explained or elucidated um, what we actually experience. And so, you know, what Whitehead really wanted to do was to give a new description of the scientific evidence in such a way that it was possible to make it cohere, you know, with our, our concrete experience. Um, it's not that, you know, appearances are to be taken as realities. Um, there's always more to be seen as we stay with an appearance, as we deepen into a phenomenon. We can, we can do phenomenology and through the cultivation of our perception, uh, see deeper than we at first were able to, right? And that's, that's what science does. Um, but never for Whitehead are we going to get to something behind appearances, behind that, that would not appear, that could then explain appearance. He thinks that is a mistake. That is the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Um, and that one way or another, we're going to have to find a way to be satisfied with, with experience and with a scientific account that is about connecting in a systematic way the various dimensions of our experience. Because again, you know, if, as a pan-experientialist or a pan-psychist, the universe is literally made of experiences. And so our scientific explanations need to um, take that into account and not think that there's something behind experience that could explain experience. That's very Nietzschean for me. Um, mm -hmm. There's a phrase you use in the book that I loved, um, even God lacks a God's eye view. Right. So it's a there's a, a super imminent vision here, which I think parallels Nietzsche's critique of nihilism. And that's a very broad critique. It goes into a lot of different areas. But a main piece of that is you don't want to put the highest reality into a non existential place. Right. If you're like, hey, the greatest thing about life is what happens when you're dead or, you know, the, the source of all reality is located outside of reality. And you're like outside of reality. That means you're saying it's nothing. <laughs> right. So it's very similar there. If we're going to take what's really real and place it into a pure dimensionless abstract realm outside of experience, then we as participatory experiential beings are saying that the highest possible value is is no value it, it's the highest reality is located in the unreal place and that represents an emotional social moral deficiency when living beings perform that action and it leads to degenerative effects down the line it leads to us you know i think for nietzsche most nihilists are not walking around saying i believe in nothing most nihilists are walking around saying i believe in some transcendental ideal and, but when they describe it to you, they're describing it as being located outside of everything we call real. Um, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's Whitehead, as I describe it, at least sort of gives, a, he revises our understanding of rationality such that it's not making reference to some transcendental set of categories or some transcendent God that's supposed to explain the imminent uh, and the concrete Rather, for Whitehead, a rational account becomes a relational account. And he says that there's an essence to the universe which forbids relationship to anything beyond itself. Just by definition, uh, if it's outside the universe, we, we can't relate to it. We can't know it. We may as, you know, it, it, epistemologically, we may as well not even talk about it because we're not talking about anything. Um, but ontologically, if we have the right sort of conception of what the universe is, we wouldn't find a need to point to something outside of it. Um, on the other hand, I don't know that Nietzsche would have been so happy with Whitehead's eternal objects. I think there are aspects of Whitehead's God that um, are more Dionysian and Nietzsche might have been okay with that. But, you know, Whitehead is a Platonist. He's a reformed Platonist as every Platonist subsequent to Plato was. But nonetheless, he doesn't find the need to make reference to a realm of unactualized possibility because that provides, you know, and, and, but, but it's, 
I tried to work through this in my dissertation, bringing Whitehead and Nietzsche in a conversation. It's difficult because, you know, that late text, The Will to Power, where Nietzsche is at his most processual, pluralistic, you know, imagining the universe as all these like centers of force, I think he calls them, and all in dynamic relationship, exerting their will. It's not that systematic, it's more aphoristic. And so, you know, I try to draw those connections, but Nietzsche is not around to, uh, to argue with us. Um, I imagine he probably did, wouldn't make the best company, at least late in his life. But yeah, I think there's plenty of parallels there. The way that Whitehead reforms Plato is by, in a very Nietzschean, immanentizing way, pointing to actual occasions of experience as the source of value and um, what is most real, whereas these eternal objects, he says, they're deficient in actuality, right? And they yearn to ingress into actuality. And so, you know, there's a sense in which Whitehead is inverting Plato, right? Rather than the forms having preeminent reality, it's, it's us down here. I think there's, uh, there's some interesting areas of parallel between these two guys, and imminence and dynamism are obviously something they have in common. This question of the eternal objects is very interesting. You know, um, when I was in school, they would describe Plato or, you know, Socrates really depends which one you're thinking of as saying there was a perfect image of a chair that every other chair was just an inadequate copy of. Uh, but then later when I read Schopenhauer's description of the Platonic eternal objects, I got more the impression that what he was saying was there's chairness <laughs> of which chairs partake. And you're like, okay, that's a little better. And I can, uh, I can relate that to a computational reality in which there's a, a particular set of potential algorithms in the computational pattern space that might outlay all the chairs or outlay all the things that give us the experience of chairness. And these are uh, ubiquitously available, these algorithms. They could be instantiated at any point in space or time. So that's a little bit like an eternal object, a little bit like a qualitative process eternal object. But it's notoriously difficult to think sensibly about eternal form. So what is Whitehead thinking of here? What is ingression and, and what is what things are ingressing? Ingression is the, so there's, there's a technical term that he calls um, prehension, which is his philosophical um, jargon for feeling, basically. He uses the term prehension because feeling is a bit loaded and he's using, you know, the notion of feeling in a strange way to refer to basically, you know, the inheritance of the past, right? We, we, we feel the past um, as it bleeds into the present and he calls this physical prehension, but there's another kind of prehension, which is conceptual prehension where we're not feeling the actualized past, we're feeling the still possible future. And the feeling of a possibility is, or the prehension of possibility is ingression. And so it's important to note that the agency here is with the actual occasion that is doing the ingressing. The agency is not with the eternal object who's saying, I will ingress here. Eternal objects are passive, sort of a, they're the plenum of possibility and they are what allows something to be held in reserve so as to provide a kind of lure. These eternal objects act as lures for actuality and ingression is, is the process whereby a concressing actual occasion innovates upon what it has inherited from the past. Right. And so, Whitehead will say things like, it is more important that um, an experience be interesting than that it be true. He adds, of course, that truth often is, is more interesting, but sometimes it's important to make a mistake or an error in how we inherit what just happened by ingressing something different, right? And so, you know, I mean, if I can think of an example, like, you know, someone you know, it's a vague example, but, you know, someone says um, some phrase like, you know, please close the door behind you. And what I heard was somehow, um, you know, please 
you know, pick up some milk at the grocery store. And it doesn't sound similar, but I couldn't think of anything better. Uh, you know, I end up going to get milk thinking that that's what I was asked to do. And that proves to be valuable, horrible example. But I think you get the idea that the role that in, the ingression of novelty of some new eternal object that wasn't really felt in the past, but that is relevant in the sense that it affords some advance in the future from what it had transpired in the past, right? Um, and this is how the evolutionary process works. It's like Whitehead's version of Darwinian mutation, right? That's what ingression is in some sense. It affords um, a difference so that the past is not merely repeated. And so eternal objects serve the, the role of holding some potential in reserve so that the actual universe and the unfolding of the evolutionary process is not merely repetitive, right? There's, there's something luring it to do something different. So it's the way that participatory imminent beings take possession of potentials and mix them with the, the matrix of existing things in order to produce some uh, novel quality. Yeah. It's like one way of getting at it is, you know, asking the question, where is the future? Right. And for Einstein, for Spinoza, right? Like, well, the future is already out there in some sense. Um, it's already actualized. Whereas Whitehead is saying, well, no, the future is a potential and it is up to the desires of an actual occasion and the and it the way that those desires ingress certain possibilities. It's it's out of that relationship between the realm of eternal objects and the realm of actual occasions that the future is brought forth. Doesn't exist yet, but it is born out of this relationship between actuality and potentiality. So, I mean, it's very tricky to, th in one way, to think about Whitehead and Nietzsche because uh, Whitehead is a very systematic thinker, and Nietzsche is a wantonly anti-systematic thinker, right? So that even though the will to power collection of notes is something that he later decides not to work on because it's too systematic and he unpacks it into some hyper stylized subversions that he publishes as books. But, you know, I always recommend people read the will to power because you get a much better glimpse of what his overall picture is than you get from his actual books, which he's chosen to stylize rather than to have it systemically represent his vision. Hmm. But, um, uh, in that volume, he goes into a lot of detail about uh, what he means by the will to power, which is a, an attempt to think the subjectivity that goes along with energy as the fundamental nature of reality. Like, what is the, what is the subjective correlate of energy? And it's some kind of intentionality to gather forces and discharge them in a way that moves something forward that attains an enhancement of some felt quality. So I'm curious on your take about how close uh, the will to power at its most basic level and the prehensions might be, because prehension seems like a very similar, you know, architectural dynamic feeling moment as, as the basis of dynamic reality. Yeah. I mean, the analogies here are pretty striking. I think, Prehension is the process whereby the perished past is enjoyed in the present. And Whitehead uses this term self-enjoyment to describe the, the, the motive of the generation of subjectivity. Like subjectivity is self-justifying in the sense that it is enjoyable. Um, and that, that joy is what drives the creative process. He calls it eros sometimes. And, um, you know, yeah, when we're, when we're trying to justify our own existence, it's not that Whitehead is a hedonist or um, that he's advocating a purely like bodily existence or, or pleasure seeking or something, you know, aesthetics has lower and higher forms. And not that the lower forms are not that are, I don't want to moralize about this, but, you know, there's, there's fine art and then there's, you know, um, less fine art, or there's joy that is in some ways um, like a, the beatific vision. And then there's, there's joy that like, oh, that bacon is tasty. And so there's a whole spectrum 
And um, the higher grades of actual occasions are realizing these really divine um, joys and and forms of bliss and ananda even. Um, whereas um, in the case of a single bacterial cell, it's, you know, yum, that's just some good glucose. Uh, and so, but, but all of those are examples of self-enjoyment. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a role for um, a kind of hierarchy of enjoyment in Whitehead, just as I think, you know, Nietzsche is trying to articulate not in always the most savory ways, um, a kind of uh, aristocratic notion of, of how human society should be, should be organized. The, the, the excellent should be allowed to lead. And I think there's a way in which Whitehead also wants to afford the social conditions so, so as to allow the excellent to, to lead. But Whitehead's a bit more democratic. You know, he's, he was, he's just a good liberal. Uh, Labor Party guy. So in that sense, I think it mitigates against the danger of the Nietzschean view, which, you know, I don't think it's fair to blame Nietzsche for anything, but you can see the direction that um, an undemocratic and non what inclusive and diverse and all these things uh, kind of Nietzscheanism can go in. And, And I think Whitehead's philosophy is intrinsically more, more democratic you know, he says, we find ourselves in a buzzing world amidst a democracy of fellow creatures. And so there's a real sense that, hey, we need to be sensitive to all of the modes of self-enjoyment, which compose us and are inside of us and, and which we live beside, because, you know, we're all in this together. And if we degrade one another's capacity for self-enjoyment, ultimately that's going to ripple back in and affect us. Um, and so there's this self-interest that's part of it, but there's also a higher value for Whitehead, which is, um, which transcends the self. And Nietzsche seems more focused on the self, I think, whereas Whitehead sees the self as a means of influencing the future, right? And so um, the highest good for Whitehead is to realize some value in the present and then perish in such a way so as to gift that value in some effective way to the future. Um, So there's a more relational ethos, I think, in Whitehead's vision than perhaps in Nietzsche in his more, um, I don't know, um, excited states. Uh, Nietzsche's, uh, I think it's fairly obvious that his emotional and relational life was... uh, tempestuous and a little bit stunted. So he doesn't come across very richly in that dimension. Although it's, he's notoriously easy to misapprehend. Uh, There's a great book on Nietzsche and religion by Julian Young, where he basically argues that Nietzsche is fundamentally a religious communitarian thinker. Mm -hmm. And that we've had this lens all the time that we just completely misread what he's trying to say. And in part, that's because He's not writing for everyone. You know, in most of his later books, he's like, this book is not for everybody. This is for specifically these kinds of people. If you're one of these kinds of people, great. Although most of them aren't born yet. (laughs) So it's uh, a lot of people who read Nietzsche might not be the people Nietzsche thought he was talking to. And that leads to a lot of distortion. But I think he's got a very strong, like particularly in Zarathustra, there's a very strong ecological and embodiment ethic. And I think there's a, if you read carefully, there's a real balance between what he wants for the folk and what he wants for the individuals, because there's different aspects. He's, I I believe he's trying to reanalyze all of our values to put them in a, a natural hierarchy of which ones actually provide more value experience and to look at how that would manifest in the world, essentially in a trans cultural peak experience maximizing civilization Hmm. and that looks a little bit different for the herd than it does for the individuals but they're both important and have to sustain each other somehow and i think that you know that self-enjoyment vector is something that he and whitehead both see going all the way up and all the way down and obviously the common misreading of the will to power concept is to think of either physical violence or social oppression and dominance, which for Nietzsche are not very high. They're not providing a lot of empowerment for the people who are doing them compared to the 
sense of empowerment that poets and Buddhas and Christs and world shapers are getting. So mm-hmm. I think there's a similarity in, in the fact that it goes all the way down and the fact that they're trying to establish a natural hierarchy that favors a certain directionality. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, obviously Whitehead is more egalitarian, more democratic, and probably in his mind thinks he's writing potentially for anyone. Whereas Nietzsche comes out of a more conservative ethos, isn't quite emotional and relational in a full way, and is definitely not writing for everybody. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's a temperamental thing. You know, Whitehead wasn't just um, a brilliant mathematician and philosopher. He was also always involved administratively in the various institutions that he worked in. Um, He was, he was active politically uh, on behalf of women uh, often, whether it was issues of suffrage or access to education. You know, when he came to the United States and was teaching at Harvard um, after which, at which point Harvard was almost entirely male. Um, when he finished his lectures at Harvard, he'd go over to Radcliffe and lecture to the women. And so, you know, he was a man who was, um, and, you know, he would have his students over once a week to his home. His wife, Evelyn, would, would uh, help entertain all, as many students as wanted to come. Um, so very sociable guy. Amazing generosity of, of his time. Um, and his intelligence and and his you know commitment to his students and so I think I would say a bit more um, well adjusted than Nietzsche. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I don't I don't think there's much argument against that. Yeah. Um, there's a you know Nietzsche has an interesting take on what the function of philosophy and the role of philosophers is to be sort of. Um, creators of value uh, as people who can put forward commanding understandings as people who can uh, organize and prioritize. I think he says, establish the rank and order of values and that that's a creative action. Uh, what, What does Whitehead and what do you think the role of a philosopher is? It's a good question. Um, I mean, one of them is to perpetually ask that question (laughs) um, and never be too satisfied with any of the answers we might come up with. Whitehead says that the, that philosophy, one of its roles is to be the critic of the abstractions of the special sciences, um, which is everything from physics to sociology, because the philosopher is always trying to keep the the concrete wholeness of of reality in mind and to never neglect the parts, uh, which in Whitehead's kind of holographic scheme are always in some ways containing the whole themselves. And so the philosopher is trying to take this synoptic vision and make sure nothing gets left out. And, you know, obviously to seek coherence, to seek consistency um, in our modes of of giving an account of, of what there is and what's happening and what we ought to do. How do we make sure that we're not um, falling into self-contradiction when we try to answer various questions, ethical, epistemological, ontological. Um, Sorry, I've got some, I live in a construction zone, so um, you might hear some background noise. And so, you know, what do I see as the role of the philosopher? I think, Ideally, and this is some of the this sort of democratic ethos coming out. I mean, I'm a Platonist, but I'm also um, a pluralist and a sort of inheritor of this American brand of philosophy coming out of William James, which Whitehead also was inheriting, um, where the ideal would be to allow everyone to have the opportunity educationally to themselves become a philosopher. Uh, so that philosophy doesn't become just the um, purview of elites, but in some way is available to all. And, you know, there's there's plenty of examples in history of, yeah, aristocrats being um, afforded the time and space to be philosophical and pursue intellectual things. But there's also, you know, we have examples of, of slave philosophers. Um, and so I think it's, There's a temperamental dimension to this, but there's also an an access dimension to this. And I think the ideal society would be one 
when I hear, I guess I'm disagreeing with what Plato lays out in the Republic, would, it would be a situation wherein everyone is afforded the opportunity to pursue education as something that is a lifelong um, joy, ultimately, not a task. It's not about testing and competing to, to be the smartest or something. It's just the joy of learning. And I think the role of philosophy now in our non-ideal society is, I think, you know, I try to advocate for um, a shift in values whereby what's, what's important is not the consumption of stuff or the worship of some transcendent beyond that maybe when we die, we get to go to, uh, to escape to, but rather um, a shift to valuing the intrinsic joy of learning and understanding, which is, which is itself um, always a communal endeavor, though sometimes, you know, we may need to break from the herd uh, to usher in some new creative perspective as individuals. Um, nonetheless, even when, I mean, I feel this in myself when I need to retreat into a kind of more introverted creative space to explore my own thoughts. When I realize something, I'm like, I got to share this with somebody. You know, there's like this, there's this feedback loop whereby I think we're always called um, to communicate. Like even Nietzsche was called to communicate his untimely visions and insights and values back to the herd, <laughs> even if initially filtered through those who were adequate to what he wanted to share. And so, yeah, the role of the philosopher, I think, is to help us maintain a civilized existence you know, by critiquing our abstractions, but by also kind of advocating for the value of learning as a way of life. And learning is different than knowledge, right? Learning is a process, not a finished product, not an encyclopedia. Um, there are some philosophers who, who did write or try to write encyclopedias. Um, that was not Whitehead's aim. It's not that, you know, a compendium of the existing set of knowledge might not be useful in some sense, but that's not what philosophers should be busying themselves with. And so I guess, yeah, uh, the role of, of the philosopher is to um, advocate for and work towards the kind of society where everyone at least has the opportunity to themselves philosophize. There's a real, um, there's a tension between the view of philosophy as an activity that's good for us, which I think, you know, when Nietzsche thinks of the philosopher as the highest form of the will to power, he's thinking very much of and with the ancient Greeks, the idea that you're basically undertaking a spiritual and developmental self-practice by yeah. doing philosophy. And versus, he means the really ancient Greeks, like before Socrates. Yeah, right? pre-Socratic, before it went downhill. <laughs> yeah, the, the real OG. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the tragic age did the work. The golden age spent the money. <laughs> um, but there's this other version of philosophy, which I think a lot of people have, at least in North America, which is that it's a kind of, academically protected way for people to have opinions about the world, that it's basically about their worldview. And I'm, I'm always curious about how, how true that is, because I think the last several hundred years have been years of domination by press, by publications, by the art of publishing, and people who are book trained, meaning academics, journalists, authors, priests as well, I think are likely to have an exaggerated view of the role that narratives and thought systems and famous authors play in human history. And it's uncertain to me whether worldviews change the world, like, oh, did Descartes implement this thing? We've all been suffering from it. And now we have to replace it with Whitehead. Or are worldviews like, are they driving the car or are they just the indicator light on the dashboard? Right. Is it a, is a secondary effect showing you where you are, but not really doing anything that the actual changes to the world are coming from something else or are thought systems actually changing things and therefore are really important to get right. What's your, what's your take on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a both kind of maybe Gebserian view of history. And also um, I can't shake this Marxist sense of the material conditions as if not determining everything, at least 
preventing certain ideas from being realized, certainly. And so there's a need to, to look at history and be realistic about um, the role that, that economics plays, the role that access to, to clean water and, and nutritious food and um, the, the role of um, sort of gender relations and like to what extent is it just a particular class of men who were afforded the education and the time and privilege to have ideas um, what would it have been like if women were afforded that? How might the ideas have been different? And so there are all these non-intellectual factors that shape what kind of thoughts we have. I'm not obviously reductionistic, though. I don't view consciousness and intellect and philosophy as just like, you know, T.H. Huxley would say the whistle on a train. Um, I think ideas are also the coal that's powering the train on some level. But, um, you know, I'm, and that was actually just rereading Whitehead's Adventures of Ideas, where the first part of it is on sort of the history of civilization and the role of, the role that ideas play in, in stirring up and shaking up um, established customs and habits. And it's a very slow process. A habit governs almost everything that we do all the time. And when habits are institutionalized, it's even more difficult uh, to have a new idea, which is effective. We might have that new idea one moment. We just read this great book. And then we go right back out into the institutionalized habits of our society. And it's like the idea never, never happened. But, you know, Whitehead shows how in the background over thousands of years, slowly and quietly ideas are shaping history. You know, the idea of freedom is, is one of them that he tracks. And it took literally thousands of years for the idea of freedom to surface enough in our consciousness such that um, supposedly civilized people were able to say, hmm, maybe slavery is unjust. You know, even, even philosophers who valued freedom in the ancient world and in the pre-modern world and, and up to 1865 in this country um, were able to somehow not notice the contradiction, right? I mean, Aristotle thought slavery was necessary for philosophy because otherwise, you know, he'd be too busy doing laundry and making dinner to, to have thoughts about, you know, how an oak tree develops or whatever. So... He was wrong about that because we now have machines that can do, you know, one work can do, one machine can do the work of 400 people, you know, so the advance of technology has liberated us from this fact of civilization that for thousands of years we had slaves, but the idea of freedom was effective in the long term at eliminating that, at least for the most part, it has been codified, it's made into law and even, even I think white supremacists now are not trying to say we should enslave anyone, right? And so that's progress, <laughs> that's real progress. And it is, the, it is the force of ideas which has allowed that progress to unfold, I would say. But um, yeah, certainly there's the force of material conditions and institutional inertia as well, right? And so it's, it's multiple factors at play here. Uh, I was reading the other day, uh, the Herald of the coming good, which is a pamphlet that Gurdjieff published before he wrote, if you're familiar with him, I'm not sure if you are. He wrote a couple Maybe. of very difficult to read books uh, that sort of founded a spiritual lineage in the early 20th century. But in that book, he says, Look, modern society could be the most amazing thing ever. And the reason it isn't is, because we don't understand there's multiple different intelligences within individuals that all have to be educated, right? You have a, an intellectual capacity, you have a feeling intelligence, you have a somatic intelligence. And if we were living the way our ancestors did, those would naturally all get educated. Hmm. But now we're not, we don't even notice there's multiple systems that we have to educate. And as a result, some people get very top heavy on intellect and they feel distance from the body and feelings. Some people are very strong on feelings and can't think or do things. People are in these different specializations. And I've been wondering to what degree that creates the effect that we're calling philosophically 
a split between humanity and nature, a split between mind and body, a split between society and nature, whether that's, you know, is it the idea of a Cartesian dualism that generated all of this? Or is it the fact that the way we're raising and training people is not such that they can integrate rich feelings, rich thinking, and rich physical activity? And so the world, when they look at it, looks split because they're split. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. You know, if you think about how philosophy was taught in ancient Greece, you know, the the gymnasium was a crucial part. Uh, the the wrestling was just I don't know, just as I can't say it's just as important as geometry, but um, certainly essential um, to a philosophical education. You know, Plato's name literally means broad shouldered. You know, and so there's a reference to his physical prowess. Uh, in his very name. And so it kind of, I think that that pushes against the Nietzschean understanding of Plato as, as some disembodied priestly type of, of man. I don't think that's, that's accurate if you put Plato back in his historical context and the, the, the way that philosophy was engaged. And, you know, nowadays we've really you know, the way Wilbur talks about the differentiation of the big three in the modern period, right? The good, the true, and the beautiful has sort of um, split off from one another and each gone their own way. And so we think of the arts as and as something that like kids, maybe they should learn about it, but hey, if we have to cut the budget, like that's just extra fluff. Um, we really got to make sure that they know about the true and, and get their science and, and technology and, and computer time. And um, that's, that's what's going to make them into good workers. And then of course, you know, the good or any sense of shared, a shared idea of virtue or, or what the good life is, is um, well, that's religion. And we don't want to impose that on anyone, whatever you think is good, as long as you don't hurt anybody else. Right. This is the kind of liberal notion, like to go for it. And so, in the context of consumer capitalism, the good life becomes um, about pleasure seeking and consumption and you know, competing with the neighbors to see who has the biggest flat screen or whatever. And we need, a, we need to really reintegrate these things to avoid the, the mutated monstrous, the monstrous mutations whereby you can get someone who's so advanced cognitively um, that they're you know, um, coming up with, with new schemes of organization for society that are totally detached from, you know, something like the inventor of Soylent. Uh, it's like, now we have more time to work because we don't have to make our food. And this has all the things that we need to just, you know, drink a Soylent milkshake and you're good. It's like, that's not contributing to a wholesome, balanced life. So we need our intellects and our thinkers to be connected to their bodies involved in, you know, we have the technology now so that we can, I think, all be involved in to some degree, like getting our hands in the soil, being involved in the, in, in the kitchen, being uh, also having time to go to the library or, or I guess surf the internet nowadays, read books though, read books, people, please read books, but also, you know, go on hikes and, you know, we need, we need, uh, yeah, I think Wilbur's integral model is helpful here to, so we get all these lines of development laid out there on the page and we can see what, what we're working on, what we're good at, what, what needs some work. Because, yeah, we do have all of these various modes of intelligence and it's one of the major problems of, of the modern period is that we have imbalanced development. Um, and that's, you know, it's related to like this, diversification of labor um, and over-specialization and over-professionalization of everything. You know, we don't educate, we don't educate people, kids or, or undergraduates to be generalists. You know, we really push them to, to major in something and specialize. And uh, I think that is damaging ultimately. It's like, yeah, we need specialization, but you can always do that later. And it, it's, you're a better specialist if it's built on um, a general foundation of appreciation for history, the humanities, the arts, uh, an understanding of the culinary arts too. And like, you know, 
just being a well-rounded human being. Um, and this is actually Whitehead was an educational reformer and, you know, wrote a lot about the importance of this kind of integrative approach to educating the whole human being. It's very important for him. I think that's uh, an area where he and Nietzsche would also have a bunch of overlap. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, Nietzsche's uh, early works were very much on education when he was educating people. And because he'd been promoted to the university so young, he felt almost in a peer group with his own students. Hmm. So his work on a particularly Schopenhauer as educator, which he later says in his autobiography is really Nietzsche as educator. But he's <laughs> trying to think of how to uh, organically and multidimensionally bring forth what these people could and should be, how to allow them to become who they are rather than just to give them an update on what the academic system currently thinks in the service of the greater society. But, um, I'm going to throw out a couple of, mm, yeah, just a couple of random questions. I've still got in the back of my mind here. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I'm listening to Terry Patton's podcast. I hear a really interesting guy. turns out it's Terrence Deacon. I read his book on incomplete nature. Fantastic. Really clear thinking on how processes become self-organizing and morphodynamic and then mutually self-organizing autopoetic teleonamic systems. Really interesting layout. But apparently, Deacon thinks Whitehead has smuggled homunculi into his theory, according to you. Um, what's Deacon complaining about? And is he right? Hmm. Uh, well, I, you know, I get into this in the book, and I think there's actually plenty of compatibility between Deacon's vision and Whitehead's vision at the level of an account of, of complex adaptive systems and um, self-organizing dynamics in the natural world. It's just, I think the difference is in regard to the, yeah, I guess the metaphysics of explanation and like what counts as an explanation and Deacon, and I've, you know, been able to have this discussion with him in person a few times. He's worried that Whitehead is um, presupposing what needs to be explained. And as I was saying earlier for Whitehead, you can't explain experience. Experience is what there is to be experience is the, what a good explanation would be in terms of, it's like, ah, oh, I, I understand that because I experience it. And so this is like Whitehead's imp radical empiricism, you could say that it's not that um, we would ever be satisfied with an explanation in terms of abstractions. We want an explanation that's in concrete terms that we can relate to and ultimately um, know is accurate or feel is accurate because we intuit it. Right. And so it's an appeal to intuition. Whereas for Deacon, no, he wants it to be totally explained in mechanical, mechanistic terms, how it is that this transition can happen from, you know, mere physics and chemistry without any purpose, without any intentionality, how just through a certain kind of organization of that stuff, something like aim and eventually consciousness can, can emerge. From Whitehead's point of view, it is metaphysically incoherent to say that experience could emerge from something non-experiential. And so that's the real difference there. Deacon is a, is a processual thinker. You know, he's not imagining that the physical world is made up of little BB balls or um, billiard balls. He recognizes that it's a dynamic process and so that's a major advance, I think. But he's, I think, accusing Whitehead of um, smuggling in these homunculi or these little men inside of even like photons and electrons that are supposedly like having experiences and making decisions and whatnot. And, you know, Whitehead uses words like decision and experience and subject in a way that is scale free, like goes all the way down and all the way up, but you know, he has technical definitions of these terms. And so we don't want to overly anthropomorphize what Whitehead means by experience. It's not what we mean by conscious self-reflective agency, um, but it is at least in some sense analogous, in some sense, it's as if Whitehead took our human experience and boiled it down in this sort of process of alchemical purification to get at what is most 
essential to it and what is the essential structure of experience as such that our human consciousness is a special very high grade example of and so that's you know whitehead's mode of operation and deacon uh, is just starting with a different premise about what counts as an explanation. He wants to explain experience, whereas Whitehead says, if we can't experience it, it's not an explanation. Nice. Thank you. A lot of people point to Whitehead as a guy who uh, maybe the first major thinker to really comprehend what quantum physics was trying to describe in terms of the rupture of our reality view that it brought forward. And there's several different ways at the moment to interpret what those equations mean. But the things we seem to be stuck with are, on the one hand, entanglement, and on the other hand, a weird fusion of unity and plurality, right? That when I look at one particle or one variable, I can't get the calculations right unless I treat it as if it's a bunch of variables. I need the whole swarm to tell me what this one's doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, arguably the simplest way to handle that is to simply say, well, yeah, they're all there. Right? I, don't have to, I don't have to add any other factor. I just say these things are all real. I've got a many worlds interpretation. They pat themselves on the back for the simplicity of just saying we take the equation seriously. It says, it says you need all these electrons to be an electron. Then there's all those electrons. That's fine. Um, what? Uh, what interpretation of quantum physics does Whitehead's thinking lead us towards? How does he handle plurality, singularity, actuality, potentiality in a way that makes sense of this physics, but also helps us make some decisions about that relative to how we think reality functions? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in 1925, when Whitehead wrote Science in the Modern World, which is in, I guess, his first really philosophical book. Prior to that, it was more math and sort of, I guess, philosophy of science. But this is like, he's doing, it's part history, but it's where he begins to lay out his metaphysics. And quantum theory was already taking shape in the mid-1920s. And the two main lessons Whitehead takes from it are two fallacies that he finds it necessary for us to, um, to grow out of. One is the fallacy of simple location which has to do with you know, the, the discovery of entanglement, this field that connects everything um, in the universe. And then the other would be the fallacy of the notion of nature at an instant, mm. as if we could, as if science could understand a particle as something fully present in any instant of its life history. And one of the things that you know, Max Planck um, elaborated was this notion of um, Planck's length or Planck's time. And it's, as I understand it, this idea that for a full photon to manifest, there's a certain minuscule amount of time. It's like 10 to the negative 33 seconds or something um, for that photon to fully manifest. And, you know, there's a wave like nature to light, right? So the idea would be like, it's a full like beat of, of that wavelength of that rhythm and that we can't measure a full photon unless we have a certain amount of time. And so in other words, this is why Whitehead develops an event ontology. Nature is made of these events. It's not made of instantaneously present particles that are disconnected from every other particle, right? It's made of this sea of vibrations, basically. What a particle is, is a vibration in a field. And so this requires basically a ground up revision of the metaphysics of science. And so that's, you know, it's relativity and also really quantum theory that pulled Whitehead into met metaphysics in the first place. And what Heisenberg was saying at the same time as Whitehead about the import of quantum theory is the, the role of potentia or potentials in nature. The wave function that Schrodinger developed is an attempt to mathematically describe these um, fields of potential that kind of um, ramify out from each measurement that is made. Um, and we can predict, not me actually, they, the mathematicians can predict 
with a very high degree of accuracy how uh, electrons, photons will behave well enough to create microprocessors that, you know, are able to, we're able to transform the world, you know? Um, so the, the technological application shows that the theory is correct. <laughs> the predictions are more accurate than any other theory in the history of science. But the, the question becomes, what is the ontology here? Um, the many worlds hypothesis of Hugh Everett is one attempt to ontologize quantum theory by saying, ah, oh, well, all of the many paths of this wave function that could be realized are realized in parallel universes that we'll never know about because we're only in this one universe. But there's a, I guess, infinitely, there are infinitely many other copies of me and you and exploring these other um, pathways of time. And, you know, I don't know, I, they used to refer to something called parsimony in science where, you know, you don't needlessly invent alternative universes to explain this universe. You kind of deal with the empirical evidence that's available to you. And so when I hear about the many worlds hypothesis that claims to be physics, I think that's metaphysics. And it's kind of like sloppy metaphysics. Like it's not even good metaphysics. Because I, I have no problem with metaphysics, obviously, but um, Whitehead's attempt to ontologize quantum theory is different. He's not um, hypothesizing infinitely many other universes into existence. He's saying that like Heisenberg, there's a difference between potentiality and actuality. It's not that every pathway is actualized. It's that each actual occasion, if it's an electronic occasion or a photonic occasion, is making a decision amidst possibility of what to actualize. And in each actual occasion, each process of concrescence, there's a reconsideration of all the possibilities that are available to be actualized. But in this sort of wave-like process of like pulsation, there is one universe that is manifest and actualized. And the wave function is describing the field of potentials available for actualization. It's not describing alternative universes. And so sometimes this is Whitehead's view has been related to the decoherence interpretation of quantum theory uh, by uh, physicists like Michael Epperson. He's got a great book on Whitehead and quantum theory. And th this approach kind of um, mitigates against what gets called like quantum woo, where like it's consciousness that's responsible for collapsing the wave function and like the moon's not there when we're not looking at it and all of this stuff that... I think over, over it's it's overblown like mysticism that's not really justified by the science, um, and I think Whitehead is actually a more mundane interpretation of quantum theory in some ways because again his pan experientialism allows allows the electrons and photons to observe themselves as it were, you know, and so the wave function is collapsing at every level. It's not just the human being that has the privilege of being the conscious observer and collapser of the wave function. And so, you know, it's also this issue of misplaced concreteness again, right? Mistaking the model for the reality. I think that's what many worlds, mm. the many worlds hypothesis is doing. So yeah, that's that's the Whiteheadian take, or at least a summary of it on, on quantum theory. Yeah, I think that's consistent with his attempt to make the, uh, the, the model should reflect the participatory and experiential reality, which seems to be one universe. Um, I love, I love the contrast between interpretations of quantum mechanics because it problematizes so many of our basic notions, like what is parsimony or, you know, are we dealing with actual possibles or possible actuals here? And that's a blurry territory. I used to strongly emotionally reject many worlds. Uh, I think, uh, the work of David Deutsch has made me open to it over the last 10 years or so. I'm not convinced, but if he says, Hey, you got one photon, it still behaves as though it's a bunch of interacting photons. The simplest explanation is it is a bunch of photons. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. And that these were not really, because for me, one of the biggest problems was where where's the space for all these other realities? But I'm like, okay, they're not really saying that. They're saying there's different, like different slices through the space of entanglement and each one looks like a complete set of histories. Well, I'm open to it. Uh, but not convinced. 
one of the things I love about it is in terms of my own philosophical thinking is the notion of indeterminacy. And you sort of mentioned this earlier, the stuff Heisenberg was doing that we call uncertainty in English gave us more certainty than any other idea in history, more provable, uns- more provable certainty. So if we're getting more determinacy by taking indeterminacy more seriously as a fundamental component of reality, that might be an instance of a more general philosophical shift, which is to say we could get more clarity by building in incompleteness to the very fundamental ontology of being. And that's part of what I think of as the metaphysics of adjacency. And mm. this popped into my mind watching you and Verveke talk. Uh, so I'm going to, well, you guys were discussing the, the problem of the source of intelligibility. And I'll give you my little quick take on that, but really just treat it as a question for your take on it. <laughs> okay. uh, so I was thinking about when I first, I'm like the source of intelligibility. I'm like, I know I've heard John say that before. And what are the prerequisites for thinking the source of intelligibility? You, you have to think of intelligibility and you have to think of it in relationship to a potential unintelligibility. So you've got these two frames somehow, whether everything's always been intelligible, in which case it's a very virtual frame, or maybe intelligibility emerged, in which case their frame was preceding it. So I immediately took that to a metaphysics of adjacency place where there's no totalized situations where you, there's no 0%, there's no 100%. Everything's on a gradient. So you've always got some degree of the relationship between intelligibility and unintelligibility. There's no condition that's ever intelligible or unintelligible. They're always mixed. You can't really ask where did intelligibility come from because it's never intelligibility. It's always a ratio of intelligibility to unintelligibility. Yeah. Even, even absolute unintelligibility would still have to be minimally contrasted to intelligibility in order to operate consistently as unintelligibility. So the question isn't where does it come from, but maybe how do we move between different ratios of intelligibility and unintelligibility? So that's the first place my thinking goes to on that topic. But how do you think about, you know, the, the preconditions or the beginnings or the source of why there's intelligibility at all? Why, why is reality such that sense can be made, that cognitions can occur? Uh, <laughs> you got 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But even to say that I don't know is already to presuppose that there is an I there is the possibility of knowledge. And so we're off and running, right? But you're right. There is always a contrast between what is intelligible and what is chaotic. Uh, even in Plato, right? The, this this um, like archetypal idealist in his cosmology and in, in, as articulated in the Timaeus, um, there's what he calls necessity, which is sort of like um, chaos, you could say. It's what resists intelligibility. And then there's the noose, there's the intellect, there's, there's the order um, that can be brought into relationship with necessity or chaos so as to bring forth cosmos, but a cosmos which is always at risk of falling back into disarray. And so Whitehead has a similar vision of this primordial creativity, which is his ultimate principle, even more ultimate than, than God. God is a creature of creativity and God is where intelligibility comes from in Whitehead's scheme. And, you know, so for some atheists, they're like, oh, he's a creationist. All right, I'm out of here. And it's like, well, he's a creativityist in the sense that there is an impersonal creativity at the base of reality. And it's, it's so potent that its first deed, which was not sort of a self-reflective decision. It was just what happened was that creativity gave rise to God and God becomes this sort of purveyor of value in the sense that God conditions creativity, which in and of itself is almost like chaos. It's not intelligible. God provides a limit to that creativity by valuing the, the pure chaotic potential. Right. And God is an actual occasion, and I should say an actual entity for Whitehead, 
but non-temporal. That's why God is not an actual occasion per se, because um, God's concrescence is everlasting and eternal. Whereas every other actual occasion arises and perishes, but God's everlasting concrescence gives some tilt or some tendency to a sort of like a gift that initiates the experience of all subsequent uh, actual occasions, um, tilting them toward complexity, tilting them toward order. Um, but they're still all, and we're all immersed in creativity uh, and this, this, this potential for breakdown, disorder, destruction. Creativity is just as destructive as it is, you know, constructive. God is the ground of reason in Whitehead, but he says, he admits like um, God's also the ultimate irrationality. The ground of reason cannot itself be rational. Right. And so it's again, an appeal to intuition. Um, it's an appeal to an aesthetic sense of the ultimate process by which um, order is brought out of chaos. Whitehead's not trying to make a rational argument here. He's trying to provide the basis for which an, an argument could be reasonably made about, you know, how the universe operates. But at the base, it is an aesthetic sense that he's trying to appeal to, um, whereby what we refer to as intelligence or intelligibility in typically a cognitive way, as if there was some like conceptual blueprint that undergirds the structure of reality. He says, reality is not built on a hierarchy of concepts. It's built out of a hierarchy of feelings and concepts are a particularly advanced form of feeling, right? Knowledge, human knowing and human science is an elaborate uh, system of contrasting feelings building up upon one another, you know, to realize a, um, a judgment of what is true. But for, for Whitehead, truth is itself a sort of aesthetic, aesthetic thing. Um, and so, you know, for Whitehead, the, the highest form of beauty and the highest value that can be realized in this chaosmos is tragedy. And that is because um, every form of order which is established will decay, will break down, will return to chaos. Um, and yet there seems to be this this preserving agent, the divine, um, that has allowed order, just enough order to be maintained for billions of years, you know, so as to give rise to, to us um, and our consciousness, which is capable of taking it all into consideration. But still, the highest form of beauty is not perfection. It's not some complete finished form that we can behold and say, ah, yes, that is the end toward which you know, we, we are, we are attending and, or even have realized, no, it's tragedy, which is this real um, sense of like the interplay of freedom and necessity um, or the interplay of like loss and yet the achievement of something. And, you know, uh, Tolkien has this term you catastrophe to describe like what happens at the end of or the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Right. And if you're familiar with that story, you get a sense how, yeah, I mean, you know, Middle Earth is saved, I guess, but, you know, a lot of dead people and the Shire is kind of messed up and like the elves have to leave. And it's not like everybody lives happily ever after. And yet there's a profound beauty which has been realized um, despite. The catastrophe and so that's kind of similar to whitehead's vision intelligibility is i think we have to say in some ways contingent it's not a given right um the existence of god is i think we have to say not a rational necessity um you can't prove god's existence rationally in whitehead's scheme it's an aesthetic intuition and really, he says the evidence for God is, is predominantly empirical. And if we don't experience God uh, directly, then any of our attempts to rationally construct 
you know, or conceptually build some idea of God are going to be again, committing the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Um, it's not that Whitehead's metaphysical scheme is, is not rational and, and conceptually and categorically like systematic it is, but it, it, its ultimate appeal is to intuition. Its ultimate ground is aesthetic, right? Um, which makes it different than the Kantian and Hegelian modes of, of philosophizing. Well, uh, I think again, tragedy is an area where Whitehead and Nietzsche are close together, right? Birth of tragedy, but also the prologue to Zarathustra is very focused on, mm, I, would, I would say the creative appropriation of arising and falling away and therefore going beyond as, uh, as, as a bringing forth of the structure of reality in the form of the tragedy. I think they both see that as a, as a peak form of the production of value in terms of how we think about the world artistically, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea of God in Whitehead is really interesting. Um, right? You say it's an appeal to aesthetic intuition. It might be contingent. Uh, it makes me want to ask, you know, is it necessary? Is, is God necessary in Whitehead's vision or could you take it out? and still have, you know, um, a consistent view of the cosmos. Is there any reason? <laughs> now, I know you just said it's not an appeal to reason. It's an appeal to aesthetic intuition. But is there, does God need to be in Whitehead's vision or not? So, you know, historically, Whitehead shows how important Christian theology was to the emergence of science. And he tells a very different version of um, European history and the, the emergence of the scientific revolution than we're used to hearing from people like Neil deGrasse Tyson or, or you know, other popularizers of a certain origin story or, or myth of, of science. You know, Whitehead points out that without this notion of a God who is obsessed with all the little details of what's happening in, in the universe, the notion of causality and that the principle of sufficient reason and, and the notion that nature should obey mathematical patterns to the degree that it does never would have occurred, you know, to, to Galileo and, and Descartes and Kepler and Newton. Certainly they themselves were, their science was theologically motivated and justified. Um, and then at some point in the 19th century, the notion of God was crossed out, but the whole epistemology, which was devised, you know, by Descartes, which presupposed a sort of divine insurance policy to ground our knowledge of nature, um, that sort of becomes implicit and not often mentioned. Actually, usually what's mentioned is an explicit denial that that is the case, but there's no alternative story, much less a, 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 an epistemological theory, which would provide a ground for mathematical knowledge of nature. Like, where the hell did that come from? Laws of nature? What is a law in materialistic terms? You know, I've, I ask every materialistic physicist I, I get a chance to talk to who is willing to, to um, you know, spend some time with a philosopher and typically physicists are annoyed by philosophers. Um, I ask them, like, what is the ontology of law? Like, and they're like, we don't know. We just, you know, we, we were able to, to elaborate them and, and make predictions. And so that's good enough for us. Um, what do you, you know, ask me, well, what do you think law is? I'm like, well, you're not going to like it. <laughs> you're not going to like my answer. But, you know, I think, do, does Whitehead scheme require God? Yes. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. His, his cosmos would, would, would fall to pieces if you remove the keystone, which is, you know, God as the mediator of creativity, if, if each moment of our experience were uh, in contact with unfiltered creativity, it, we would be overwhelmed and unable to decide what to do next, right? God is the purveyor of relevant novelty to each occasion of experience. In other words, God provides an initial aim that doesn't determine the decision that we make in each moment as, as to how to actualize the possibilities available to us, but just sort of whispers in our ear and says, hey, you might like this, like come this way. What we end up deciding is, is a free decision because again, 
we are still immersed in creativity. It's just that we have this sort of divine umbrella. Maybe that's not the best metaphor, but the sort of um, divine filter that helps us uh, advance the cosmogenetic process. And so if you take God out, there would be chaos in, in Whitehead's scheme. And so on some level, um, you know, the, the theism aspect of Whitehead's thought is, is important. And it's, it's also important though, to remember that he is extremely critical of the conception of God as some sort of a dictator or imperial ruler who is imposing law upon the universe. Um, for Whitehead, to the extent that the universe is lawful, those are emergent habits which have arisen in the course of cosmogenesis as a result of the collective decisions of the actual occasions which compose that universe. So it's not a doctrine of imposed law, but of imminent law or emergent law. Um, and you know, for Whitehead, these laws can change in the future. The speed of light for Whitehead would be something that we, we should expect to be variable at other places in the universe or at other times in the history of the universe. Gravity, I mean, the notion of an accelerating expansion of the universe, very Whiteheadian notion. Einstein didn't like that notion. And so the role of Whitehead's God is not to impose law, but to act as a persuader. Whitehead says God is the poet of the world. Whitehead also says God is the fellow sufferer, right, who is experiencing with us all the pains and sorrows, but all the joy as well. And so it's a more, uh, sometimes I call it an incarnational view of the divine, whereas the typical, it's funny, most Christians have such a, they, they emphasize God, the father, this transcendent otherworldly being who's always pissed off for some reason, and not the, the image of Jesus, who, who's the figure that, you know, is pasted up on the walls in all the churches. It's like God became flesh, people. God died with us as, as a human. And it's when Nietzsche says God is dead, I hear that. I mean, and there's lots of, you know, um, theology after the death of God. And there's this whole movement um, that tries to take Nietzsche seriously, but still be Christian. I think Whitehead is a post-Nietzschean Christian in the sense that he's really emphasizing that incarnational dimension of the divine as something imminent within the universe, within each moment of our experience not just as human beings, but imminent in the experience of all beings in the universe. Uh, there, there are actually a lot of parallels with Nietzsche here. I mean, the, the God is dead thing is uh, famously not, uh, not a proposition Nietzsche is bringing forward, but a way of criticizing atheists at the time of thinking that they can just not believe and that things are different. <laughs> and they, they, A, are still believers in many ways, but B, they don't understand the change that's happened in the society where their relationship to ultimate value and coherence has altered. Uh, but he's very, you know, what you're saying about uh, God and Jesus, I think Nietzsche would think of as very Dionysian, right? If we read that passage at the end of Beyond Good and Evil, where it's a very religious, it's almost a hymn where Nietzsche describes his God. And that God is tragic and joyful and a uh, deeply suggestive, you know, a kind of enchanter who calls you to the depth of the next moment. Mm -hmm. And that seems very congruent with what you're describing about Whitehead's God. But, you know, I noticed you use the word purveyor several times. And I'm curious what you, what do you imagine when you think of this purveying activity? What's going on there? I mean, when we, it's, it's the source of inspiration. It's the, um, you know, it's something that uh, in psychedelic states, you know, I've, I've contacted more directly, I think, which is this, this sense that, you know, as, as Meister Eckhart would, would put it, um, the eye through which God sees me is the eye, the eye through which I see God is the, the eye through which God sees me. Or as Augustine would, would, would say, you know, the divine is closer to myself than I am to myself. And so typically when I feel like I'm more in touch with this 
what Whitehead would call the initial aim or the divine eros, it feels almost like a, like so obvious that I am shocked that I missed it in my normal everyday, you know, more occluded consciousness. So it's so basic to our moment to moment experience that we neglect it. We, and it's, it's so consistently there. This, this divine love is so consistently there that we don't notice it. But when we're able to attend to it, it is, it can be overwhelming because it's like, wow, it's, it's like when a child first becomes mature enough to realize the love and devotion and sacrifice that their parents have made um, for them to, you know, have a fulfilling childhood, you feel almost guilty, in a, you know, and this is, this is why I think mystics often, particularly, I guess, not just in the Christian tradition, it's in Islam, it's in Judaism, the sense of sin, like, wow, I have taken this for granted. And I feel like I owe uh, apology to <laughs> this being that has, you know, given me to be. And so, you know, I think there's been an evolution of consciousness such that I, I don't know that emphasizing sin is really the, the, the important way to go at this point, though I also wouldn't dismiss it in the way that a lot of new age um, folks would want to as, as in some sense, an evil doctrine. I think having some sense of sin as like missing the mark, as in being ignorant of the divine love that, that is um, shaping each moment of our experience. If you don't have some way of making amends for how it is that you so often forget that that love is impelling you and, and making your life possible, then I don't know how else to make sense of what's going on. And so sin is just a way of, it shouldn't be something we point at others and say, you're a sinner. It's something that we experience in ourselves as the sense of, it, it, it allows us to make sense of how redemption is possible. That like you can move from this state of ignorance to a state of being attuned um, to this divine love that creates you from moment to moment. But the fact that we're able to sin, that we're able to miss the mark is a source of our freedom or it's evidence of our freedom, I suppose. We're not determined by God. God's not saying you must. If God's all powerful. He wouldn't need to say you must. He would just make it so. But, you know, God says you might like this, you know, and it's up to us to follow that divine intuition um, or to try something else and we're free to try something else and that leads to a very dynamic you catastrophic or you catastrophic universe um, but in the end whitehead does have what he calls the consequent nature of god there's the primordial nature which filters creativity and the consequent nature which kind of remembers everything it's sort of like the guarantee that after the shamanic journey, when you've been, been torn to shreds, you will reassemble. And so there's this sense of, of grace that um, allows the universe to remain whole, despite the fact that it is perpetually recreating itself. And so for Whitehead, our religious institutions and modes of worship can be um, aimed toward or, or um, um, supported by this sense of the consequent nature of God that, you know, despite our tendency to miss the mark, ultimately the divine love is pervasive enough that we will be caught and everyone goes to heaven in the end. Um, as, as few Christians, but, but some like origin, you know, has this, this notion of even Satan being saved in the end. And, you know, Whitehead is definitely carrying forward that, that form of a redemptive theology whereby, you know, we all, we all make it to the promised land. Sin is, um, I mean, it's so often used as a narcissistic tool for denouncing others or as an ideological cudgel for maintaining a social order, but in its positive sense, sin affords us the possibility of uh, the self-refining character of remorse and mm -hmm. the realignment that's available to us. And, you know, I, I, I love that we've come to this place in the discussion. <laughs>
you know, because mm-hmm. it's very, I have a toss up all the time. You know, part of me says, you know, I could talk to Matt all day about this stuff. <laughs> Another part of me says, well, I want to value Matt's time. And how, how long do I think people are really going to listen to a podcast about the intricacies of Whitehead? <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm trying to decide between I need a third factor in order to make that decision. Mm-hmm. And that factor comes when something changes in me. So mm-hmm. that, that last little riff you were on, <laughs> uh, that love is in my heart. So this is a successful conversation. <laughs> yeah. I, I think so too, Lamin. Um, we really, I hope got to a place of, um, you know, moving from the technicalities of Whitehead's scheme to more of a sense of its relevance for the difficult moral um, um, trials that a human life puts us through and where do we search for solace and and a sense of strength amidst a world that um, doesn't provide us many sources of hope uh, right now. I think having a cosmological context that is set within a deep time and these larger creative rhythms, you know, it gives us, it gives me at least, more of a a sense of the long trajectory as, as Eric Weiss would put it. Um, And that while things may seem dark now, it's part of a cycle of creative destruction. And ultimately we do not know what the future holds. The future is wildly indeterminate, right? And so it's not that pigs are suddenly, suddenly gonna grow wings and fly. So there are certain things that are more probable than others, but Um, nonetheless, I think, um, there's reason to at least have this attitude of wait and see and an attitude of how might I participate in, you know, certain, um, more desirable futures. Um, so hopefully we can leave people with that sense of what, you know, finding their role in this, in this cosmo genetic, uh, creative advance. Well said, Rabbi. Thanks for talking with me and I hope everyone buys your book. (laughs) Thanks.